Hey, welcome to Guitar Knobs, the guitars, gear, noise, and nonsense podcast hosted today by these knobs. Tony Dudzik, Pick Guardian. Jared Brandon with Brandon Wound Pickups. Hey, everybody, it's me, Todd Novak. Welcome to the Guitar Knobs podcast. We're really happy that you are listening. You've ch- you've made the choice. You said, mm, what do I want to listen to? And you chose us. And then, honestly, that makes me feel really, really good. And I know it makes Tony feel good. And I know it makes Jared feel good. And I for sure know it's going to make our special guest feel good. Special guest, who are you? I am Chris Vincent with r to r Electric. Hey! And that hey, is, Chris. if you're looking for that on the, on the internet, it's R2R Electric. Uh, and where can, you, where can they, people find you? Uh, so they can find me on uh, r2relectric.com or Instagram. Uh, I'm at DJ Lava Lamp. Ooh, okay. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. I, yeah, <laughs> we'll get into it. But I didn't start this. Uh, I, like I didn't it. start this to become a business. This is just it was my personal Instagram, and it just kind of right. went from there. Right. Nice. Right I on. just accidentally got awesome. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Whoop. Uh, oh, I know how that feels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are beyond excited to be talking to Chris today. Uh, many of you who have been listening for a long time have probably heard references of R2R Electric. We heard it from 29 Pedals. We heard it from uh, Hello Sailor. And uh, he's making some really, really fantastic sounding pedals and, uh, and doing them in a pretty original way. He's kind of not just, you know, doing his own thing. So we uh, want to celebrate that. And so make sure you go and check out some of the things he's doing if you have, app- uh, if you have the opportunity while, we're, uh, while you're listening. Uh, we've got a couple of announcements. We want to thank Ro. Ro- I decided to jump in there with you guys. Uh, so we got the Roadcaster Pro here doing the heavy lifting for us. It's heavy, a fan- heavy. fantastic tabletop yep. contraption that is enabling this podcast and enabling not only our voices to come through, but also to have this uh, fantastic exchange with our um, supreme guest tonight. And we have the, uh, the Procaster mics kicking it live, as they say on the street. So mm. it is Can happening. Can you really say that on the street? I've, well, I've been told that. Okay. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much for doing that. And uh, we want to give a th- shout out to John Finnell for hosting our, uh, you know, the studio here and l- enabling us to have all our gear and whatnot here. RelayRecording.com and JohnFintel.com, J-O-N-F-I-N-T-E-L. Uh, he is a fantastic producer and audio engineer that is uh, very, very interested in making sure that your Awesome guitar tone is the tone that you want when you're uh, recording. And even if you're not, so if you got any questions, you know, shoot them over to him. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer. Not having asked him. Um, <clears throat> so, gentlemen, what is going on in our music worlds this week? We're going to start with Tony Balonsky, and then we're going to check with Chris. All right, so this week, so I've been playing around with uh, some uh, bass contour circuitry uh, in guitars. And, um, I mean, for for lack of a better term, the bass contour is basically a a bass cut uh, versus a tone control, which is basically a treble cut. Um, And this comes in handy sometimes if uh, you have a, a really boomy neck pickup and things like that that you need to filter out some of that real low end bassy kind of stuff. Um, I've I've been using it on a on a couple of Rickenbacker projects uh, that I've been rewiring, and um, I'm really liking the ability to uh, to filter out some of that bottom end, especially like if you're in the in the neck position. Um, so I've converted. Uh, uh, some of them over to have a master tone and a master uh, bass contour knob instead of two tones. Can I have uh, a bass contour knob on the table when you guys finally get back in the studio to cut out your bottom end? My bottom end? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Todd, that hurts my feelings. Oh, man, you really <laughs> brought down the party. <laughs> no. But anyhow, uh, but it's kind of cool. It's a simple circuit. Um, it's, uh, you know, essentially like if I, like I typically use 0.022 caps for my tone controls, this is a 0.002, uh, 
uh, capacitor uh, that you use on the base control or base contour. And, um, you know, it's a, it's passive circuitry. Um, it works really well. And like I said, just to filter out that bottom end stuff, it, it works really well, especially if you're going for that real bright, chimey sound that, uh, that I love. Chris, do you ever put any of those on your pedals? Uh, kind of actually, it's, uh, it's not so much a bass control, but the, uh, the input capacitor of the, the range master is a, a 5,600 Pico ferret or 0056. Okay. Uh, so it filters out a lot of the, uh, of the low end. That's why it, that's the reason it's called the trouble booster is not so much that it boosts trouble. It just doesn't boost anything below. I forget the, the actual frequencies, but it cuts out anything. Right. Um, sorry, not cuts, but it, um, it just doesn't boost or amplify. So you're only getting kind of like a high highs and mids push, uh, instead of the whole thing. So on, um, my two knob version or on the version that you guys have too, the amp top, that six way switch is increasing the, um, the value of that capacitor from the, you know, very small to very large. So uh, 22 is like, I think position five. So like a standard O O two, two cap that you'd have for like a tone control is position five. So it's actually, you can hear how much that actually lets through. And then the last one's a a 100 NF or a 0.1. I think if I had a treble boost like that, I would, I might want to call it like the Gomer pile. (laughs) I love it. It's like, you know, everybody's lined up and the sergeant says, I need a volunteer and everybody backs up a step, but he doesn't know it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. Uh, is oh, there, Jared, is there a thing for that in the actual military? What's that? When you like, is that called something when everybody else is like, uh, not me? And the not me also works. It's not as sexy, but well, you know. it, there's not really anything that's. It, it's not called anything. They if they don't get a volunteer, they just choose people out of the formation. Yeah. There, yeah, I mean, there's nothing. That's just called not volunteering, and then getting, <laughs> and then getting involuntarily chosen. Yeah. Okay. Or nice. chosen involuntarily. Yes. Or what that. What does that mean? I I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, they just they just choose you, and then you go do the KP duty because you have to work in the kitchen all day instead of training. Breathe, huh. breathe, Jared. But you get you get your choice of you know really good pie and stuff. You know, when you go to eat, it <laughs> makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, you know, there's goods and bads for every little avenue you have to take in the military. So. Uh, <laughs> nice. Make it sound yeah. like the facts of life. Uh, all much. right. So, <laughs> uh, thanks for the uh, the info on that, Chris. Um, yeah. It led to all kinds of fun. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so, how about what's going on in your music world? Before that, what's your favorite kind of pie? Oh man, favorite kind of pie. I'm going to say blackberry. Ooh. Not bad, especially in a pie. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty good. That's what it's to, that's what we called it. <laughs> wow, well, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> an actual we didn't pie. Say what kind of I think you crust. want. And you he know, said blackberry. I, I take that <laughs> back. I, I, <laughs> I think I would fight uh, <laughs> and, and I would think I'd rather have a blackberry cheesecake. Oh Ooh. yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> If we're gonna do uh, cheesecakes, then yeah. No, man. we were doing pies. I the believe the question well, was there, there's, a, there's a lot to choose from in those in those dining halls in the military. It's like going to an old country buffet, but the desserts are a little better. <laughs> oh no, I'm not kidding. It, it was really? it was good. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, oh, we're off the man, rails. We're totally off the rails. Yeah. Ooh, right, is this a guitar podcast? By it, the way, it is. It is. Let's get back to that. Hey, so Chris, right. Chris, yeah. how you doing? What Good. is going on in your music world this week, friend? Man, that is a it's a fantastic question. What is going on in my music world? A lot of a lot of testing. Unfortunately, my uh, my world revolves mostly around building these days. Uh, but when I get a play, I've been plugging it. I just built uh, an Esquire, uh, just like a parts caster. Oh, cool! Uh, recently and. Uh, so I've been picking that guy up a lot. I got a big fat neck from Warmoth. Uh, it was in their parts bin or whatever they call their like pre-made mm-hmm. necks. I didn't order it custom or anything, but I had them put huge frets on it. Uh, Dunlop 6100. Oh, it's wow. really like big, Sweet. Uh, almost bass frets. And it is so much fun to play. What pickups do you have on it? 
Uh, that actually a guy got in touch with me. Uh, he goes by Oat Soda Sound Company. Uh, and hmm. he's a dude in Arizona that just, uh, I guess he's been winding pickups for himself and for some buddies. And uh, he reached out and uh, asked me if he could send me some. As I've been trying to put together the uh, like a 59 style Esquire custom. I played one uh, years back and it just, it was still like one of the best guitars I've ever played. Nice. So I've been chasing this 59 Esquire because I can't buy one. For, for those who don't know what an Esquire is, would you explain that? Oh, of course, yeah. Uh, Esquire is a single pickup Telecaster, um, and the it still has the three-way switch. It's just wired differently. So you get um, position one is straight through. like the It doesn't go through any of the circuitry. It's pickup to the output. And second is... So no tone control. Runs, right, I'm sorry, it's... You go through the volume, there's no tone control. Okay. The second position, you get a tone control and then standard volume. And then I did th what's called the Eldred wiring diagram. And that puts uh, another small capacitor uh, and acts kind of like a filter. It's kind of like a, a, a low contour, like, you, like yeah. you're doing. Just no control over it. It's just a set value. Right. Nice. Um, it's just kind of always on. Um, and the I changed it a little bit because it's usually a, a bigger value. But I wanted it to get kind of, I really like kind of that mid-range honk. So I did like 8,500 picofarad or something. I tested a bunch of old Sprague Bumblebee caps that I had sitting around and found like an odd value and stuck it in there. <laughs> awesome. So that sounds great. That's been a lot of fun to play. And uh, is that just net like uh, what color? What color did you do the guitar up? Uh, it's a uh, sunburst, Ooh, sunburst, the nice. uh, double bound uh, sunburst, which is just kind of a classic look. I always really like that. I wanted Lake Placid Blue, but I couldn't find one that was double bound, so I gave up after two years of trying. Mm. I like mm. it. I like it. Mm. That's a fun um, one. Thanks for the explanation on the on the Esquire. I think a lot of people just think it's a single pickup Tele, you know. I mean, right, which yeah, it is, it, but there's more to it, obviously. There, yeah, yeah, it's really versatile uh, for being a one pickup guitar. There's a lot of stuff you can do with them. Mm. And a lot of people like them because there's no pull from a neck pickup, mm -hmm. a magnetic pull from a neck pickup that, uh, you know, a lot of people say strangles the strings. Uh huh. There's something to it. I've, I've the last four guitars I've bought in a row have all been single pickup. Yeah. Uh, I like that idea. Um, is there? Do you think it feels a little more? Does it have like a little more snap or a little more twang? Or what, what's the what's the sound that you like to get out of it? Yeah, I think it's probably the, uh, it's got a bit of that twang. The other two have been Les Paul Juniors, a, a sixty-one and a fifty-seven, so a SG style and then a single cut style. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just also something to the rap tailpiece i think on the gibsons that i really like mm -hmm. it's um the the third or fourth one i guess i should say is a firebird one copy by greco um yeah and so the three are all rap tail pieces and i there's something about the feel of a gibson on a, and a rap tail piece as opposed to a tunematic bridge that i just found i really like mm. um and, and yeah i think they're a bit snappier and they just they're very present like when you're playing them it's almost like playing an acoustic guitar like you all your mistakes come through, which is a good or a bad thing, mm -hmm. I guess. Like it's, there's just less string there, wouldn't you say? Yeah. There's, you, there's less string. There's probably less. Um, I don't know. You use, there's there's less flex in the string. It's just a lot a lot stiffer, right? Wouldn't you say? Right. Yeah. It, and it just feels. It feels different. I'm not sure how to describe it, but yeah, just the... No, you're, you're dead on. I mean, and, and the, the cool thing about the wraparounds is there is a direct transfer of vibration to the body of the guitar. Exactly. And There's that's not why all the extra. I, I love wraparound bridges. You can't intonate most of them, but... Um, you know, there's ways around that too. Yeah, there's there's some companies that have, have made those to where there's Allen wrench... Uh, screws right. in the back and you can kind of go it, it, it somewhat intonate them. There's the old lightning rod version too. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think advanced plating made one that's that's really nice. 
Uh, yeah. that that's easy to, but yeah, you're right, Tony. I mean, back in the day, it, it was what it was and that was it. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. if you look at that compared to, you know, even Gretsch had, you know, those, uh, basically a, a round bar that, you know, you just adjusted the, the base of the, of the bridge to get it about where it ought to be. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it's, so, I've got an old yeah. badass bridge in a drawer somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like those Tony Baloney? <laughs> Ate them. I didn't pick that up through that. Time. Are they? That's are they not just what I got from you? Are they? Uh, are, what do you hate about them, Tony? Now that we brought it up, I got to know what's bad about it. I, I never liked it either, but I want to know. Yeah, I think they're they're overly clunky. Um, about the, I mean the. Tone Pros made a, a a decent bridge, and in, in my opinion, there's a couple others out there that are actually pretty good that are somewhat adjustable. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But my go-to on all of those has always been I just go go with a you know a standard tailpiece uh, because I I just like the simplicity of that, and I think the more stuff you, you more screws and moving pieces and parts that you add to it, the less tr- uh, mechanical transfer you get. Yeah, and a rhythm player is going to basically stay closer to the headstock anyhow on a fretboard. Yeah, keep it under five, you're okay. Yeah, yeah. as long as you're not trying to record super precise prog Mm -hmm. rock or something, you don't need to be completely intonated all the way up the fretboard anyway. Amen. (laughs) Todd's and I's favorite band, Kansas. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) no. Um, (laughs) But I like that. That that, that would be a great shirt to wear at NAM. Intonation, who needs it? Yeah, <laughs> um, close enough for rock and roll. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sure. Sounds more important. Well, gentlemen, that was a delightful conversation. Um, let me ask who might. Uh, oh, Jared. Let's go to Jared. Yeah, I was like, are you going to skip me this time? Yeah, man. No, man. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I got this email the other day, um, and it. In this fella, it, it came from a, a Canadian army email. So it was a Canadian army email. And the guy's like, Hey, how you doing? I'm a, this is, sorry, this is my work email. I'm a um, lieutenant colonel in the Canadian army. And I'm like, <gasps> You know, because I was in the army and a lieutenant colonel is like a super high, that's like a battalion level commander that, that commands about. I don't know, like two or 300 people. Mm-hmm. So it's a big wow. deal. So I, I was like, oh my gosh, a lieutenant colonel might buy a product from me. And I just got all excited about it. And I'm like, I emailed him back. I'm like, oh, I serve too here in America. And we also talked with a, um, you know, someone in the uh, British Navy just last week and da, 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 da. And I'm so happy to talk with military people. So I'm all excited about this. Two days later, he calls me today. I'm out in my truck running some errands and, and I get a phone call. The phone number just looks like a normal because the Canadian numbers look normal on my phone. I answer it and the guy's like, Hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm Mark. I emailed the other day and I said, Oh, hi, Mark. Uh, I'm sorry. I get a lot of emails. I'm not sure. Oh, hi, Mark. You know, and I'm, and I have no idea it's him until halfway through the conversation. I just feel so stupid. <laughs> and and I don't even bring it up. And I got so upset about it. And we had a great conversation, by the way. I mean, I, I answered all his questions. It was great talking to him. So I call him an hour later because it just got to me. I'm like, listen, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I was talking to you. You're a lieutenant colonel in the Canadian Army. Da, 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 da. You know, I should have offered you uh, a lot more courtesy with military respect and all that kind of thing. And he just... Oh, don't worry about it. No, 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 no. You know, and but uh, yeah, that just came automatic to me, and it and it bugged me. It's like you do three years in the in the army, and that it just still, you know, it it sticks with you, even though it's just about guitar pickups. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Right. But uh, it was really uh, it's it's kind of been a coincidence that he's he emails me. I I got a an email from I did a. a a job for a fella about two weeks ago. That's in, in the, uh, army here in the U S it's been pretty military lately. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But, uh, that's about it. I don't really have a punchline for this other than 
I made a and the guy who was who called you up. You didn't know yeah, who it was. Okay, didn't know who it was. I felt so. I wish I was in front of my computer <laughs> so I could get his name and then look it up. You know, and then I'd know who I'm talking to. Yeah. But you don't you don't remember every single email, every single message that you get. Hmm. So you know, you yeah. just have to play it cool and navigate your the way around the conversation. I think that's why a lot of businesses don't even answer the phone anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. I can dig it, man. Yeah. Hey, I hey, speaking that. of the Canadian Army, what's up in your world this week, Todd? <laughs> <laughs> General well, Todd. Yes. Well, uh I I've uh I've been very just busy having some fun, just playing just playing pedals and junk and, and flipping around guitars and just trying to get as much time in as I can. Um I uh, it's a little tougher, but um I've been trying to put more combinations together that I wouldn't normally play and mm. he's trying to just kind of go like, Hey, I could allow myself to, to, to have some of these tones in there. You know, I've been paying attention to a lot of recordings and listening to like little stuff. And I'm like, you know what? I wouldn't have guessed that they would have had that, that sound on there, but, um, but I can hear it back there. And, you know, even though over, oh, like I, I will bring this up all the time. It's like, I love the cars and, just even dropping my kids off at the pool. Uh, at the pool. <laughs> and no, I yeah. actually took my kids yeah. to school. <laughs> you may want to take that one out. Oh, <laughs> tough it up, tough it up. It's not that cold. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, on the way to school, they love listening to the cars too. So we're um, we we're listening to a couple of songs, and and I was paying attention to some of the. Some of the stuff that you can't really hear unless you're really paying attention, but you're like, I love this sound and I don't know why, but then you can start to pick it out. And I was like, I wouldn't have thought they would have had that there, but they do. And, and so I've been looking for those little, little sounds, types of sounds that aren't the upfront sounds that I can layer into a song and get a little of that extra special sort of thing. Do you know where you're hearing old buddy? What's that? You're hearing a 70s SG with a pair of DiMarzios in it. Well, I understand what you're saying. And you're not totally wrong. But listening to Elliot play um, different types of things in the back where he's not up front, but he's layering in all these little bits and it's like, ooh, you know, little yeah. effects and stuff like that. When, when you hear it on the radio, like especially their big hit, you know, um, they only had one. That's what I needed. Yeah, that yeah. one. Uh, if you try to like play that solo, it's 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 a lot harder to play than than what it sounds on the radio. That's for sure. Well, There's yeah, because you have to play it on a left-handed guitar. Yes. The yeah, with the Marzios and seventies yeah. SG. Yeah. Well, anyways, I was talking specifically about more, um, you know, like uh, the backfill, the stuff. backfill stuff. Yep. You know, he's doing like heavy delays, but they're just it's barely audible. But it's adding that little sound to the to the stuff, and I play a lot of rhythms. Um, it's almost all. Uh, it's pretty straightforward rock and roll. And but I'm looking for that. I'm always trying to get like a little extra something that gives that song a sort of like I can't put my finger on what this is, but it's there's there's something really cool to it. So that's what I was doing. So there, nice, nice. Oh, you got some producer stuff going in your brain, dude. Oh, yeah, always, exactly. dude. You know that. Oh, yeah. Uh, Lots of fun stuff. So, Jared, you yeah. want to give this another shot? Uh, born the f oh oh, it's the uh, what are we doing? The uh, <laughs> how about some of this? How about some of this? <laughs> that's that's pretty good. It's pretty good. You get another one in there, Jared. Get it. Can they get scared? Come on, you held back. You want me to kind of do that? The weird, do whatever thing? you want to do, man. You do whatever you want, man. This is your show. All right. Well, how about some of this? <laughs> I like the first one better. <laughs> one, two, one, two, three, four on the floor. Hey, Todd. Yes. You know, back in the day, and I'm talking way back in the day when I was wiring up my pedal boards actually we didn't even have pedal boards back then we had a piece of wood and we we and we glued our pedals to the wood right. and then we put all these cables in between elmer's and, glue and we liked it mm -hmm. yeah but uh you know i used to make all these little shorty cables to try to run stuff between and 
What a mess. I mean, it was like a, a spaghetti storm, mm -hmm. definitely. Mm -hmm. Nice. Then, not terribly long ago, I discovered a great source for abling. Mm -hmm. Could you guess who that might be? I think I can. It's Tour Gear Design's patch cables. Yep. Absolutely. These things are lovely. They're small. They're as far as I can tell about the most dependable ones that I've seen, mm -hmm. and they're not, t they're very inexpensive. They are. And they, and they come in a variety of, you know, shapes and sizes that you can mix and match depending on where your jacks are on pedals. I, I mean, I, I really like them. I, I, you know, there's something beautiful about that flat design of the cable as well as the, the little, Tiny, teeny, tiny. Low, yeah, it's got an incredibly low, low profile. profile and a small <laughs> profile. Chris, have you ever used these? Uh, I haven't, but I now I want to. Yeah, you, you you must. Do you do a lot of pedal boards? I imagine. Uh, I've done in the past. Yeah, I've uh, I've got a few. I always try to keep one for small gigs, one for bigger gigs, and uh, I'm kind of spoiled, so I've got several pedal boards. Yeah, and, uh, I'm always rewiring them and. Uh, it's a pain. Yeah. Well, next time you do it, you might want to try these out. Uh, TourGearDesigns.com forward slash discount forward slash the guitar knobs. Use that and you're going to save 10% off your entire order. Okay. Very affordable. Perfect. All right. Uh, so make sure you guys go check that out. TourGearDesigns.com forward slash discount forward slash the guitar knobs. Make your pedal board happy. And um, thanks to Tour Gear for making an awesome product. All right, Chris Vincent. That's a yes. freaking cool rock and roll name, by the way, man. You lucked out with that. I did. It's it's not bad. It's it's pretty sweet. Um, can I can I call myself that just tonight? Sure. <laughs> Todd Vincent. That would be so weird. Todd. Uh, Chris. So you got a four on the floor, and we can't wait to hear it. Let's do this. Uh, what's right. number one? Uh, well, I got to uh, call the classic. Uh, I. Number one for me is always a range master. Ever since I discovered it, I am been a huge fan of that effect, and, uh, and not just mine. I anybody that makes a treble booster or a range master style treble booster, I've probably got one at my house somewhere. I just I love that effect, and I can't imagine playing without it anymore. Is there a particular brand that you or or? I guess style. I know you make a couple of different ones, but um, yeah. What what's the one? You, what's your go to? Uh, my go to actually has been from a guy that goes by Veritone Pedals, Adriano. He used to be here in L.A. Uh, and he's now in Italy. Yeah, but he makes a uh, treble booster, uh, kind of a range master style treble booster, and that's called the Valiant. That I've been a big fan of for a long time. I reached out to him after buying one and we kind of hit it off and we've been friends ever since, but I really like that. And I've also got an amp top version, kind of like the original, um, from a guy over in the UK, uh, pigeon effects. And he makes really cool replicas of, uh, old pedals, like tr the, uh, John Horn, Hornby skews treble booster and the range master and stuff like that. And big fan of those. Nice. I like it. I like it. Okay, what's number two? Number two is going to kind of just go straight down that line and uh, fuzz face. I can't live without my fuzz faces now. Uh, ever since discovering what a, a, a good fuzz face sounds like. There's tons of them out there, um, but when you find a good one, it's kind of a magical experience. Aren't there and good ones with the Germanian transistors and stuff? That's what most people would say and mine is a germanium one too um i would mm -hmm. argue that if you're going for like the dunlop fuzz faces that they're making these days they're um their jimi hendrix uh fuzz that they make uh fuzz face is a bc 108 i want to say which are silicone transistors and it's by far one of the best sounding um fuzz faces that's like a major production that you can get out there for like, you know, under a couple of hundred bucks. And, uh, I think George trips had a lot to do with designing that one. So that's probably why it's so good, mm. but yeah, mine's a germanium one made by Dustin Francis. Uh, it's called, he, he makes 
extremely detailed replicas of uh, fuzz faces from every year that they were made from 66 to 70 or something like that. Uh, and he sources all the, the original parts and it's, it's pretty nuts. Nice. But I, I played a ton of, a uh, ton of original ones and I have to say, I like his better than any of the vintage ones I've played. Nice. It's really good. So get yourself a good fuzz face. Yes, yes, yes. Three. So number three, I was having a hard time with this because people are going to say there's no modulation or time-based effects. And as much as I love them and I do use them, next one is going to be any kind of fuzz that was made by uh, Blackstrap Electric. A guy named Matt Seppi makes these, and they are just the coolest fuzzes he finds you know kind of like me he finds old parts and he does his own take on uh vintage circuits everything from like the zonk machine to mm. uh, i have one of his range masters um but his stuff is just incredible i it's more like a piece of art than it is anything else not fuzz face but like tone bender style uh fuzz mm. i think okay. would be my mm. third Nice. And but especially built by him. Mm. And then my last one is going to be the first in the chain because it's the 29 pedals Yuna. Uh, ever since getting that Ooh. and putting it on a board, mm -hmm. it's just incredible what it I'm does. waiting for mine. Uh, it's, it's something that you didn't know you needed until you have it. Mm. I and believe then, you. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so that's why I got one. <laughs> it's amazing. It's just it makes everything better. Just, I don't know mm -hmm. how or why, but you know, there's any any rig can get you like ninety nine percent of the way there, and it's that last one percent that I think, especially as a player, that we really are kind of looking for is that last little bit that just gives us the inspiration to play something new or it just helps inspire new things. And uh, I'd say that Yuna does that for me every time I plug in a pedal board now. Awesome. I cannot wait to get mine. That is a heck of a board. Now, so, so do you think that that's, is, is it the impedance that, uh, that the Yuna changes that, that makes it sweeter, I guess the sound I would, I definitely think that has a lot to do with it. Um, the first two pedals, uh, the Range Master and the Fuzz Face, are also the reason that you can't put buffers in front of them is because they're looking for the impedance of the guitar's pickups. They're uh, designed to run off of that specific impedance. That's uh, good to know. And that's why if you put a buffer in front of it, it just it sounds terrible. It sounds thin and really weak, and it's because it's getting something that it's not expecting and so it, it just the circuit doesn't work that way um so if you have like a buffered tuner don't put it in front of that don't put it in front right and the yuna specifically has that uh, that loop in it to take uh to take the um your germanium fuzz or your germanium trouble booster and put it in its own separate loop so when the yuna's on the pedals aren't going through it when you turn the yuna off that's when they turn on basically is how that ah. functions. And so it kind of just is a multi-tool to, if you use vintage style pedals like that. Um, so obviously I, that's another, you know, big reason I like the Yuna, but yeah, I think that impedance really, it, it's important. I don't know why, you know, I, I'm not sure the physics behind it, but I think that it is important to, your overall tone for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, that's always been the thing with, you know, uh, people that have long run, long cable runs. Right. Where a lot of pedals are going through generally like having a buffered preamp, even if it's a unity gain amp and just to, just to change the impedance down and, and allow the signal to travel, I guess, more cleanly or further or whatever it is. It does. Right. Yeah. You can definitely hear it. If you've got a 60 foot cable, it's uh, it's a heck of a lot different sound than you know plugging a three foot cable in. Yeah, makes sense. Dig it, dig it. All right, Chris. We 
uh, have you on the show because you make some awesome stuff yourself. And it's Thanks. great that we've been talking about how awesome everybody else is, but now it's talk, time to talk about how awesome you are. <laughs> so, um, you, uh, we, you came up when we were, when we were talking to 29 Pills and, um, you know, he was raving about him. Uh, Jesse's and, awesome. Yeah. So, uh, we trust, uh, Jesse's taste and, <laughs> and understanding of what sounds good. And so I immediately, I think on the show, actually, when we were doing that, I'd follow <laughs> and, nice. and I realized that I was like, oh, wait, I've seen your name come up before. So cool. It's always fun to hear, to, you know, you dropped like one or two that maybe not everybody's familiar with. And so it's always fun to get like, oh, wow, I didn't know. I don't know what that is. And then all of a sudden you're into it and you're like, well, I can't wait to get something from this person. So it's, um, it's really fun. I love I love discovering new uh new guys that are building stuff it's just exciting yeah it's it's uh it, i mean way it keeps the whole thing moving right so speaking of keeping the whole thing moving you uh have is it fair to say that you've made your mark with the range master yeah that's definitely where uh my focus has been um Pretty much the whole time, I've I've heard from many people that I'm the treble booster guy now. So, right. and I, uh, when I say range master, I'm I'm saying it like Kleenex. It's like there is a there's a brand called Kleenex, but there's but everything else is still called Kleenex. So <laughs> totally, and it and it's basically that. But the range master really is was the one. Like there was a few co- like similar things, but basically anybody who says treble booster, they're talking about a range master or some derivative of that circuit for sure. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, that's that's really what I've made my mark with, and um, it all kind of happened by accident. <laughs> but it, sorry, I've got a dog here. No, that's all right. <laughs> he can listen. It's fine. Hello, doggy. <laughs> hey, pop. So, uh, tell us about this happy accident of yours. So, uh, me being a mostly a vintage vintage gear junkie, uh, I want everything to everything to be vintage. Um, and so this all kind of started from me trying to find tubes because I'm sure we've all gone on eBay and we want to find a black plate RCA 12 AX seven. And then you see the price and then you say, forget about it. (laughs) (laughs) So I started thinking, well, you know, I've seen tubes in old, like, you know, they use old PA heads and there's, there's gotta be something out there. And so I started finding, uh, stuff at you know thrift shops or antique stores and tearing it open and seeing what it had in there i think the first thing i had got was a old 16 millimeter projector and it had a like a westinghouse 12 ax7 uh buried somewhere in there it took me like a whole day to figure out how to take the thing apart um but that was kind of like the aha moment like these do have good tubes in them so i started just buying up what i could find you know i wouldn't wasn't spending much. If if it was over 20 bucks, I'd probably just leave it because I didn't want to, you know, A, litter my house with just a bunch of carcasses of old tape players. Um, and B, it just be just as expensive. So I just started taking them apart. And as I was taking them apart and finding these things, uh, I'd see that different ones had different parts in them that I'd recognize from old amps or from old pedals uh, you know, oh, this has got central lab pots in it. Those are pretty cool. And uh, so I just started saving them, not knowing what I was doing. Um, I just knew that they were probably worth saving. And for years, I did this. I did this for like two, probably like two years. And one day I got two tape recorders. One was solid state and it had these transistors in it that turned out to be. Um, transistors that had been used in a bunch of fuzz pedals. So then I thought, hmm, well, maybe I should start saving these transistors. And I had never been very good with electronics. Like I I could install a set of pickups maybe. It was about the most I had done with the soldering iron before all this happened. Uh, But I met a friend and he was a pedal builder. So I gave him some parts and asked him if he could build me a treble booster because that was the only thing that I had enough parts for. And he looked up the schematic and called me one day and said, it's done, come out, let's try it out. And I brought out my, uh, an old Guild amp. that's kind of like a 
kind of like an Ampeg, copy of an Ampeg mm-hmm. um, from the mid-60s. And we plugged this pedal in. And th- the first time I hit it, I was just like, oh my God, this is the sound that I have not been able to find my entire life. I've been playing you know, 20 years at this point. And I always had this sound in my head, what a guitar is supposed to sound like. And it finally was coming out of the amp I was standing in front of. And so that was kind of the aha moment that, um, A, the range master, that's what all the fuss is about. I'd never heard one before that. And B, maybe old parts do matter. Maybe they, because they just, for whatever reason, that combination sounded great. Uh, So my friend Tucker, uh, his company was called Lamp Electric, uh, and he made crazy noisemaker pedals uh, that I could never understand, but he was great. Really great guy. He's unfortunately uh, passed away a few years ago. Um, so I had started building. Um, I had one, the one that he made me, I still have. Uh, and I started copying it. I you know, looked up the parts and I'd call him and say, well, what does this part do? What do I need? Or will this work? And he kind of helped me and I started practicing so that we could start this company together, building these pedals out of vintage parts that I had stored away. Uh, and he got busy with his stuff and I just kind of kept doing it. I built, I think I built like five and I thought, wow, if I sold these for a hundred bucks a piece on reverb, I'd have like 500 bucks. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. And so I threw them up on reverb and, uh, a couple of them sold and, I would post stuff on Instagram. Really, all everything kind of happened on Instagram. I would just post what I was doing, like, you know, here's the next one I built. And I build 10 of them or something and uh, throw them up on reverb for 100 bucks a piece. And then, you know, a couple of weeks ago by and wanted to sell here, wanted to sell there. And I, once they all sold out, I'd have 10 more and. It just it literally kept going like that, and it's two and a half years later, and I just packed up and I'm shipping out number seven hundred ten. Wow, uh, that's amazing. Today. So yeah, things just uh, things really started to snowball when a couple of artists. Um, I had um, Nick Perry bought a, a pedal and posted about it, and that was like really the big starting point. Like I. I was selling a few here and there, like enough to like, like it was kind of a part-time job. It was a good side hustle. Uh, But once Nick and then Mark Agnese from Gibson posted about one Mm -hmm. uh, that he got from me and that went nuts and it's just been growing ever since. And I'm still just kind of doing the same thing. Like I've had to make a few improvements in uh production process and selling process and stuff like that like everything used to be i would hand make you whatever you wanted like if you wanted it to be blue with red knobs and this transistor with these capacitors um was kind of how i did the first maybe 100 or 200 or so um or they were just kind of a mix and match that i made i was spray painting everything in my apartment bathroom because i'm I'm doing all of this from my kitchen table in my apartment here in Hollywood. We, oh, wow. uh, we, uh, space is at a premium here. So, uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's hard to, it's hard to find a workshop or anything when the rent's $10,000 a month. Yeah. So I just, I'm still, I'm still doing everything out of our apartment and, uh, just been crazy. It's been super fun. I mean, it's, it's very, I feel very lucky to be able to do what I'm doing. Cause I know like I never intended to start building pedals. Cause I felt like the world didn't need another pedal company by any means. Yeah. There's plenty of people out there making pedals and they make good pedals and they make great pedals. And I still am not a, I just still don't consider myself a pedal builder over a guitar player. Like I still think of myself <laughs> as a guitar player, but that's that's not what I do anymore. Yeah. What were uh, what were you doing before uh, you switched over? Uh, I'm mostly composing and session work. I'd been um, before moving to LA. I was living off of playing gigs and doing sessions up in Seattle, mm. uh, which is where I'm from. I was born and raised up in Seattle, and then about ten years ago, moved down here with my girlfriend, who's now my wife, 
and uh, I was doing mostly composing like for TV commercials or short movie shorts, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so it was, um, that was kind of nice. I was working at uh, the Sam Ashdown on Sunset Boulevard part-time doing composing part-time, which gave me the time to go and find all these tape recorders to pull apart. And, you know, in my downtime when I wasn't working as a composer or whatnot, I pulled these things apart and then taught myself how to build range masters. And I gave up the, I quit the job at Sam Ash two years ago and quit doing composing basically, except for a few friends I'll, I'll still do stuff for. Uh, and I've been full-time pedals for a year and a half or so. And it's when I say full time, I I work twelve hours a day, seven days a week, every wow. day. Wow. I <laughs> I tried to take Christmas off, but I actually really like what I'm doing. So I just when I'm bored, I go sit down and start building again because I just really like it. That's awesome. There you go. Oh, to be so lucky, right? It, I really am. Like you know, to the old saying is, if you do what you enjoy, you never work a day in your life. Like mm-hmm. if I wasn't making money off of this, I'd still be doing it because I just like it. That's awesome. Fantastic. I love to hear origin stories, how people fall into it. And not unlike so many others that we've had on the show. I mean, I, yeah, I I don't know how many people we've actually have admitted to saying, yes, I set out to be a pedal builder. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I don't think many of us do. Yeah. Yeah. It's remarkable. It's funny. So you're doing that many treble boosters and, and that's, you know, you're, you're finding all kinds of neat ways to make them interesting and aesthetically different and et cetera. Um, do you ever have the, do you ever find yourself saying like, man, I really want to do something like off the rails different? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, the ideas I get are, especially for me are, pretty ambitious considering I don't have any kind of technical background in it. Um, I'm, I'd love to, I'd love to make a tape echo someday. And I'd love to, I, I would love to build like a, uh, the old D Armand, uh, tremolos with the little oil in mm, them. It's just a motor cancer. and, mm. uh, that kind of stuff, you know, oh, things okay. that I have no business trying to make and they make no sense to make, but <laughs> they're just fun. And they, they sound, they sound like the record and that's what I like about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Chris, you had, you'd sent us the amp top version. Yes. The treble booster. Um, is that your top seller or, or some of the other pedals that you offer other versions of that, uh, the bigger sellers? I think that probably the the stomp box version with the two knobs is definitely the the best seller. Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of hard to know um, because of the way that everything's set up. I have to, if I just put up order, like the way that I'm set up now, if I just put up orders like through my website, I would probably have a two to three year wait list. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> as fast as I can build, like it's, insane That's incredible i i don't know how it happened but so the way i set it up i just have to pick an amount that i can physically do in a certain period of time mm-hmm. i try to keep it short because i don't like to take people's money and not deliver quickly mm-hmm. um so i usually do batches of about 25 or 30 pedals uh, and i try to do that every two weeks um but i have to kind of base it off of what takes longer and what takes less time. So the stomp boxes go a little quicker than the amp tops. So I mm-hmm. usually don't make as many amp tops available. Um, so the, because of that, the, the stomp boxes are the better sellers. I've sold more of them, but that's mostly because I can make more of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if it's actually would be the better seller or not. Um, it'd be interesting to know, but I just, I don't have the bandwidth because uh, I'm still just one guy doing everything and it's hard to keep up. I'll tell you it's, it's pretty nuts. Do oh, you, yeah. I, 
Tony, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, I, you know, both, uh, you know, Jared and, and, and I both have helpers, but even so it's tough to keep up with orders and right. emails and everything else that, oh you know, God, that yeah. this type of business requires. Jerks bothering you about being on a dumb show. Oh, they hate, uh, yeah. Yeah. They say that <laughs> kind of podcast is that. Uh. <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned some of the, the magic that's in these, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the things that you're listing that's that's in these pedals are, I would imagine, pretty hard to or are getting harder to get. They, yeah, they're definitely getting harder to get. The, um, I think it's 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 subjective about the magic part of them. I have a theory or philosophy on what I think sounds good, and I think the sim the more simple the gear, the better. Kind of like when we were talking about, you know, one pickup guitar, there's just less things getting in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you look at a schematic of a Dallas Rangemaster, it's like six parts, really, what it comes down to in the actual circuit of the uh, of that effect. It's one transistor, three resistors, and four capacitors whatever that comes out to be. Uh, and there's something to that and it's just a volume. Uh, it's, there's no separate gain or anything. I have added the, the switch. Um, I think that's a magic myself. That, that's, I, I would agree with that. That definitely mm -hmm. helps. It gives you a lot more tones out of it. The, uh, so the original range master would just be position one on that switch. Right. So that was the original effect was just that one thing. Um, which is great, and that's still probably my favorite sound out of all of them, but uh, it's still, it, I think that the switch kind of retains the magic because it's, um, those rotary switches take everything else out. Like, you'll see treble boosters with a two or a three-way, like, toggle switch, mm -hmm. um, but there's one capacitor that will always be in that circuit uh, if you do it that way. Um, so there's all there's either one or two capacitors like adding on each other, mm -hmm. and with this the rotary switch, uh, it's literally breaks the connection from the switch the capacitor before it, and it's just that one cap. So it's just kind of like uh, mechanically switching out right. a capacitor. Mm -hmm. uh, so it keeps it true to the original circuit, and there's something to that simplicity. I think um, you know running back then you'd be running a one or two pickup guitar into this range master into an amp that had, you know, a master volume and a treble and bass control or a tone control. Um, and, and a ton of volume. <laughs> yeah. And a ton of volume that helps yeah. too. The, yeah. Um, that helps. I think a lot with, um, it's power tube distortion is really where you're getting, uh, a lot of that tone that you get out of a cranked non-master volume amp. Yeah. Um, and there's a difference between, uh, you know, with the amp with the master volume, you're cranking the preamplifier to get that, to get the overdrive. And when you don't have a master volume, you have to push all the tubes to their limit. And I think that's kind of where that, uh, a lot of the kind of magical tone sits as well as just being really loud because mm -hmm. the range master adds another 20 something decibels on top of that cranked amp wow um so it's that's <laughs> what one of the complaints that i have got in the past is that it's just too loud like can you make it quieter and <laughs> that's it sounds good because it's loud it doesn't sound good <laughs> quiet it's not a good quiet pedal yeah it does now, it's pretty magical when you do plug that i had it going through a supro uh, the the black magic. And oh, nice! Yeah, I was like turning, 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 and then I hit the spot, and I was like, "Oh, mama!" <laughs> yeah, there's a certain spot that you just hit. It's just this confluence of everything working together. That's just yeah. I was so like I was it. like smiling, like my face hurt because sometimes <laughs> that happens. Not all the time, but when you do, you know, you it, it just it feels it feels like you're speeding in a car with the top down and you don't care. It's fantastic. Totally. Yeah. That's, you know, that was that feeling I got that first day. I, uh, I plugged in my first range master that my buddy built me, you know, it was just, I couldn't wipe the smile off my face and it's really fun being able to do that for other people. Yeah. yeah. 
Now, in terms of the the power source, is is this like true to the you know vintage pedals that they actually prefer uh, nine volt batteries as opposed to a, a uh, like a digital power source? Yeah, they definitely they were designed to. Well, the original was designed to work on a a, a strange. Uh, British nine volt battery that looked kind of like a C battery, but it had the the little nipple thing on both ends instead mm. of like Jared. Uh, one, yeah, kind of <laughs> like that. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, maybe a D battery. Now that you mention it, <laughs> um, but yeah, they're they're meant really for nine volt battery. Seems to be the best. Um, I put the nine volt jack on there just because it, it's it doesn't change the tone so much as that. Um, you need a really clean power source because um, a lot of nine volt adapters uh, I've found can be pretty noisy. They just cause some extra hum mm -hmm. with the circuit and the battery is usually the cleanest source of power. Um, power bricks usually are pretty good, like a Strymon or a Voodoo Lab, stuff like that. Um, and even like, I usually have pretty good luck with a one spot or like a boss adapter but some of the other cheaper ones can make a lot of noise uh, mm. with it. But I wouldn't say it takes away from the the actual tone of the pedal. It just, it's adds, a noisy it pedal noise. to begin with, and it yeah. adds more, more noise to it, right? Right. It actually makes it easier, especially if you're playing live with it, you know, because then you don't have another plug you got to figure out where to go because it's probably not going to be anywhere near your pedal board. Well, yeah, especially with those amp tops, it can be... It can be kind of a pain to run a whole separate thing, especially off of pedal power. I, I've seen a few uh, pretty funny ways that people have used it. Like uh, a friend of mine, Doug, has got his. He bought an amp top first and liked it so much he wanted it on his pedal board. So he just put Velcro on the top of it, stuck it upside down on his pedal board. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad idea. It works. He yeah, he ended up getting a pedal too, but he still got. I think he still got that amp top just stuck on his pedal board. It's awesome. That's hilarious. <laughs> I like that. Can I ask uh, about signal? You know, since you are the, you you mentioned some pretty epic fuzz and drive stuff in your in your four on the floor, and then you yeah. got the treble boost. What wh what do you think about the mix? It like, uh, you know, with fuzz, you typically want to have that, and the you know first in the chain, and, and everything seems to be that it has to be first in the chain. So like if you have a fuzz of tr okay. your treble boost and the um, 29 pedals, I mean, you're going to pull your hair out trying to figure that out. Yeah, signal, the your signal chain can be frustrating. A, because yeah, some pedals have restrictions and B, because it's so subjective too. Like, uh, but as far as the, the pedals that, have requirements such as the uh, fuzz face, tone benders, range master, treble booster, stuff like that. That's looking for a specific impedance. It it's fine as long as everything before it's true bypass. That's kind of I think why true bypass became this thing. Um, it's it's one kind of switching system and there's not buffered bypass is great. If you're going to be running a lot of pedal boards, I think it was because of the vintage fuzzes that people started really thinking that true bypass was the only way to have a pedal, mm -hmm. uh, because buffers made your, you know, vintage pedals sound like crap. Um, so yeah, if you want to do, I like to do treble booster into fuzz face, uh, but reversing that really no, no issues with that again, as long as they're not buffered bypass. Is that a different sound, though? Oh yeah, I mean your your signal chain, the pedal order can be so massively different. Like I've started building some wah pedals, and I'm finding a lot of uh, interesting things of putting a wah pedal in a chain, like a fuzz face before a wah sounds completely different than the fuzz face after the wah. But if you have these old style circuits, the output impedance of the wah pedal doesn't match up with the input impedance of your fuzz face. So there's all sorts of things that can go wrong with it. Um, mm. So you got to be careful. Right. Yes. Yeah, it could be right. I mean, <laughs> some people say, you know, it's a hard, fast rule that you don't put, you know, delay before your drive, but some people do it and it works great. Like it's a specific sound, but 
who's to say that that's bad or good? It's it's also subjective. So I always when I have a lot of people ask me that, like, how do I set up my pedal board? And it's like, well, I can tell you the way that I can tell you the way that it sh- quote unquote should be done, but that doesn't mean that's how you have to do it. Um, you know, there's the filter boost drive or distortion fuzz modulation time based and out to your amp i I like the idea that you might have referred to well i don't know if i do it correctly but i can tell you how larry johansson does it and larry johansson told me this and you you create this myth of this guru this sound guru named larry johansson right and then pretty soon there's like you know uh, on on Premier Guitar, there's articles about Larry Johansson and <laughs> and like reverb, like oh, this was played by Larry Johansson. Larry Johansson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally, it could happen. Make it happen. Somebody make that happen. There. I'm gonna. I, I we'll just I put it out into the guitar verse, and there it goes. Larry Johansson. Larry Johansson. Uh, Chris, you, you've uh, you've delighted us with the. Um, with the you know the pedal or, well it's not even a pedal what is it <laughs> it's the effect <laughs> with the effect that you sent over and let us uh, play with and you let our us get our rock and roll socks off big time and um, I know that you've done that for so many people already and um, and we loved hearing your story is it was really fantastic uh, are you you're just gonna keep doing doing this and making these things and uh, any anything new in the uh, you know future? Uh, well, as for keep doing, yeah, I'm gonna keep doing it until people stop buying them. I mean, that's I'm just getting a kick out of doing this, so I'll keep doing it forever if if uh, people will let me. Um, I've uh, I've always got things in the back of my head that I want to do and I'm trying to do. It's it's tough to get uh, it's tough to get new stuff off the ground. It took me two years to get these wah pedals done, but I finally, finally got a pretty good system with them. Um, and I've got, I just, my third batch of them I put up, but it was the first one I had done in probably over a year. Uh, and they sold out in 10 seconds. So I'm a little scared to put more of them up again, but, uh, I'm getting ready to do some more of these wahs and then I'll probably do some iterations of that. Like kind of like with the treble boosters, they used to all just be one knob. Then they, they were two knob, and then I did some amp tops. So with the wah pedal right now, <clears throat> it's two separate parts. It's like a head unit with a cocked wah control, mm-hmm. and then you can hook like up that. an expression pedal and use it as a wah. Um, and I've been getting a lot of questions about just you know uh, just a wah pedal, you know, to itself. So mm-hmm. that's definitely a possibility um, in the near future to do something like that. Um, beyond that, I've got. Like, kind of like my pinnacle of treble boosts. Um, I've been working really hard over the past few years to put together the all original parts and do a small run of like true replicas of the Range Master. So uh, I'm getting really close on those. It's It's been a long, arduous process trying to find all these, because all the parts are British. So I'm trying to find outdated vintage British parts in Los Angeles. So it's been a lot of eBaying and talking Mm. to people that live over there and friends that live there looking at surplus stores and stuff. But I finally got pretty much all the stuff together. I'm just waiting on a few like uh, the little details like the face plates and stuff to get made and then I'll have those coming up. And then hopefully after that some fuzzes. But who knows? I, you know, but the trouble boosters keep me busy enough as it is. So yeah. Well, if you cut production we'll down in half, then they're twice as awesome. more valuable. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, but but then 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 like fellows like us couldn't get it. So that's not fun. What am I saying, Chris? We're really grateful that you spent some time with us. Uh, we're it was awesome hearing about your whole backstory and all of the fantastic things that you're doing and. Um, it's nice to have the option to get something that is weird and wonderful and handcrafted and one of a kind. 
Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate you guys having me on. You bet. You bet. Yep. Jared, I know you're itching to do this. What do you got cooking there, buddy? Oh, man. Um, This would you rather this week. Um, It's going to come after this little song that I sing, and it goes like this. Would you rather? That was a really nice one, brother. Wow. Wow. Save that. That's good. This would you rather this week is brought to us by our good old pal, Tony Baloney. Yes, indeed. So Tony says, hey, man, I'm Tony Baloney. And you just get called up from a last minute jazz studio session. While you were walking down the street, John Esterly, eh. you don't have time to grab your favorite jazz box and have to head right to the studio. I mean, it's like, call, okay, I'll be there. Gone, you are. You don't know where you're, you ain't got time to grab it. So you just leave. The studio has two guitars. Number one, an old acoustic with a sound hole pickup and a Floyd Road. And, and that's one of the guitars. Sorry. So old acoustic with a sound hole pickup. The other one is a Floyd Rose equipped super strat. Yes. <laughs> Which axe do you choose to record with? Super strat, awesome Floyd Rose get up or old acoustic with some sort of sound hole pickup. Okay. Uh, so maybe probably, a brand, maybe a Brandon wound or a, or a big chief. <laughs> from Under Chief. Back in the day. Yeah. Under Chief. Well, all right. That's uh I think this one's gonna be pretty easy to uh go through here. Oh. I mean, unless Tony's got some we- weird surprise here. So uh well let's go around the horn. Tony, Chris, and Jared, and I'll wrap it up. Well, I'm going with the Floyd Rose equipped super strat. I absolutely <laughs> what? Yeah, what? what? No, I, you know, so I, I kind of thought of this because it's, it's just, you know, it's one of those things. Some people are more comfortable on, on electric guitars versus acoustic guitars. That's but true. That's me. For a jazz session, I think you can get closer to what I would call a true a jazz a sound and tone from the acoustic guitar with the yes. sound hole pickup. Yes. I mean, so that would be my choice. I'm going in and I'm grabbing the acoustic. Hopefully, I won't get tetanus from the strings that are on it, and uh, and just plug in and jam away. Yep. Is this what kind of jazz is this? Is this like bebop? Is this it's like smooth jazz, baby. Smooth, smooth jazz, jazz, like smooth jazz, smooth jazz. Is so, there any other kind? Well, yeah, there's lots of kinds, but uh, <laughs> you know, are we t- okay? All right. That helps out anyways. Uh, Chris, about yourself? I think going, I think I'm going super strat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I'd have to go that way, especially if we're doing like some smooth jazz jams. You can still, you can roll off that tone and just get, you know, you can get some nice good lead tones. I mean, that's what the old tone control's for. Exactly. You got to use that. It's there for a reason. Yeah. Good choice. Well, you know, if it's a Martin D38 or D28, sorry. Trust me, it's not. Uh, <laughs> all right, so it's like a, an old guild with rusty strings. I would take an old guild with rusty strings. I have several old with guilds old. with rusty strings. Well, honestly, the Super Strat would probably be a lot easier to play, especially uh-huh. with a Floyd Rose. Really? But if you're going to do bends and stuff like that, it's a lot easier to use the old acoustic, you know, as long as the strings aren't going to, you know, cut through your fingers. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I guess I guess I'll just be brave and try the acoustic first because Tony's right. Especially but you just switched. If, no, no. I All right. I think I, I said as long as. Um, yeah, yeah. Ernie's disagreeing. Bert, well, yeah, that's Bert and Bert oh, and Bert. Ernie. They both they both say, you know, if if it has a super chief sound hole pickup, that's one of those old DRMans. Then or or a thunder chief or a thunder chief. Then you should probably use that. So I'm going to go with acoustic uh, with the 
with that sound hole pickup. They're magnetic, just like the other pickups out there. So yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think I'm going to do the same thing, pretty much the super strap. Not the super strat. Ah. No, I am gonna play. Yeah, you know what? I think I am actually gonna do the super strat because no one's gonna see you. You're gonna be in the studio. I well, and I'm just I'm more comfortable on an electric. There you go. Even though it's a strat, which I hate, but whatever. <laughs> I, I gotta do that. I gotta I gotta take that path. Uh, let me ask. Now, uh, remind me, Tony Baloney. Is a super strat? Does that have the real nice pointy, heavy, metally horns on it? Well, it can. I mean, what I what I call a super strat generally is a Floyd Rose or Kaler or whatever one of those uh, you know trim systems, usually on an HSS mm-hmm. uh, or an mm-hmm. HSH. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they play out. They came out with the the series. I I'm, I don't remember if it was. I think I have a Squire neck through actually. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a strat style, but it's a neck through guitar. It's actually pretty awesome guitar i'll you know but yeah. uh um it's it's different yeah uh, uh, but anyway i was just wondering i mean they came in many forms i guess but, oh yeah i mean yeah, yeah. i mean true. that's and that's really the the era that you know ibanez came to power and you know that that really pushed them forward in their for competitive R- reasons they just kind rs of, and rg series yeah. yeah and that was their that was their 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 shining moment mm. yeah all right. Well, that was a that was a pretty decent uh, one you got there, Tony. That was a good one, Dave Connor. Yeah, well, it made you think, didn't it? It did. It made me think because I was that I was actually torn for different reasons. Um, so uh, good, good one on you, uh, Chris. We're gonna thank a few people and uh, wrap up. Uh, all right, can you hang around for just a minute? Absolutely. Awesome. Cool beans. Well, you're right, Todd. At this point of the show, there's a very special group of people that we like to thank. That's right. These are our executive producers, and they help make this podcast possible. I love you. (laughs) I love you too, Jared. (laughs) No, talk about the executive. (laughs) I thought you were just so impressed with my delivery. Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) So you might be asking, well, yeah, this executive producer thing sounds pretty cool. How do I become one? Well, what I want you to do is to go over to patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs and check out a couple of different levels in which you can participate and become a patron, a sponsor of this very podcast. That's right. Each level comes with its wonderful bevy of thank you gifts, including things like T-shirts and keychains and barefoot buttons and picks and stickers and all the good stuff. But... As an executive producer, you get all that great stuff and one more thing. And what is that, Jared? You get to have your name right on the thing. Your name right on the thing. And that's what I'm doing right now. So special thanks to these executive producers, Mr. Tom Barazin, Martin Cliff, John Daly, Chris Kearney, Darren Gregory, Doug Christ, Michael Van Zant, Ken Sayers, Brian Robison, Michael Senchek, Stefan Lamb. Johnny Knowles, Anthony Lanthrop, John Anglin, Tyler Bray, Brad Partridge, Chris Seidel, John Esterly, Doug Gann, Justin Jones, Brett Alexander, James White, Matt Hart, Liam Martin, James Pennington, Richard Kendall, Ty Harmon, John Williams, John Jackson, Jason Roush, David Rando, Douglas King, Gary Cooper, Rob Saxby, and Elad Mizrahi. Wow, that's a new name, isn't it? Elad, Elad, Elad. Not really Elad. sure. He's got to get back to me. He just—I think he's torturing us because he said, "Hey, have fun saying my name." Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I think I, I must think have I got, said it different last week. I think I—I I think I've got the Mizrahis <laughs> right. The Mizrahi's great. Yeah, Elad, Elad, Elad. 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 or Elad. <laughs> right. We're happy to have you no yeah, matter thanks, what. Buddy. No matter no name. matter how you say it, we thank you. Yes. Thank you. All but right. wait, oh, there's yeah. more time. Oh, Don't okay. stop me. All right. Because there is a level above the executive producer. That's right. We call them our grand poobas. That's right. 
This is a very special group of people. They have to wear a fez while listening to the podcast. That's right. In the club on top of the skyscraper. The penthouse suite. So special thanks to these grand poobas. Mr. Jonathan Jerusik, Corey Nigro, David Kaminga, Cody Lane, Cody Foster, Sean S. Yes. Tommy Manasco, <laughs> Mark Garten, Adam Johnson, Steve Keys, Tim Nowak, and Tyler Rines. All thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You, uh, you. You guys are the spice of our lives. I'm telling you. That's right. Chris, thank you so much for joining us on this show. Uh, we really enjoyed having you. And um, best of all success. Although it sounds like you don't need so much of that wishing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good luck, buddy. <laughs> uh, thank you guys very much for having me. It's been a pleasure coming on. You bet. You bet. Yeah, it was fun. And where can people find you? Uh, last call out to, to just make sure everybody finds uh, what you're what you're making. Uh, mostly on Instagram, it's at DJ Lava Lamp or my website, uh, which is r2relectric.com. Awesome. And how about, uh, Tony Balonsky? Let's just say you need a special pick guard. You want to do yeah. something fun. Say you've got a special birthday coming up. Ooh. Ooh. I got a question. Yes. What if you have one of those really long Gibson pickups? One of those real oh, like on the uh, the old uh, what were the, was that the ES three uh, hundred? Yeah, what are, ES they're super long. They go from like yes, the, yes. Yeah. I've been doing some work with uh, with Lindy Fralin on That's some right. of those, uh, making some bobbins for him. These are the, some old jazz boxes from the forties. And Tony 50s. does it all. Everybody, mm. I do it all. But That's let's awesome. let's focus on the pick guards, if you will. Okay, mm. head over right. to pickguardian.com. And just check out some of the things that I have available there that you can purchase. Uh, by and large, what I do is custom work. So shoot me an email. Let me know what you need. I will take very good care of you. That's right. Awesome. Jared? All righty. If uh, you need some pickups, uh, give me a buzz and we'll get you hooked up. Especially <laughs> wow. if you are a lieutenant colonel in the Canadian Army, I will hook you right up. What's your website? Uh, Brandon Wong pickups.com. We do wide range and, and the noiseless jazz master. And I can even do a noiseless telecaster. If you ask me to, um, <clears throat> a bridge pickup, I have whatever one. you need, we, we sell new pickups to look old and we fix old pickups up. We rewind them. We do the, uh, rewind time with Brandon Wong pickups. Please go to YouTube and join me and, uh, we'll have lots of fun. You'll learn a thing or two. Awesome. You can send me an email, Todd at theguitarnobs.com, or DM me and the crew on Instagram at guitarnobs. Send us your would you rathers, doggone it. We we need good new ones all the time. I'll sing it nice and pretty. That's right. And yeah. uh, make sure you go check out Chris Vincent over at R2R Electric. And, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to get on, uh, you know, the the list to get one or grab one however you can list or no list i'm not even sure just get your hands on one of these dang things and we really look forward to hearing about these new things that you're doing in the future so please keep us posted with that chris will do and uh, in the meantime everybody have a great guitar week and subscribe yeah. Yeah. you want to clap me sure Can he hear that? Yeah. Bert, stop it. <laughs> Let's do some coffee talk. Yeah. Yeah. What do do? What do da? What a ding a ling a ding dong. How about now? That's better. Better? Can you turn it all the way off? <laughs> Jared. Jared. It might be Tony. Let's see. <laughs> Jared. <laughs> Because you do have those can hear besides the headphones, headphones on, right? <laughs> what are they called? <laughs> I can't describe it again if I tried. <laughs> well, that's it for these knobs. Please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs. Visit our website at the guitar knobs.com for all of our past episodes, four on the floor blog, and other good stuff. You can connect with us on social too at our Facebook page. 
and share your gear and stories on our Facebook group. Also, be sure to check out our Instagram, at Guitar Knobs. Catch you next time.